Hello students, my name is Abhishek Sudhir and I'm an assistant professor at Jindal Global Law School. Welcome to EPG Patshala. Today, we're going to be discussing module 4, the right to freedom of religion under the Constitution of India, which is part of the paper on civil and political rights. While the makers of the Constitution of India set out abstract principles guaranteeing the individual's right to freedom of religion and conscience, it is the Supreme Court of India that has played a key role in safeguarding this right through judicial interpretation. All rights need to be interpreted, and that's what the Supreme Court has done in quite an extensive and liberal manner. The court, some might say, has managed to discharge its duties commendably so far by putting in place an Indian model of secularism by applying the principles set out in the Constitution. The Supreme Court has held that secularism is a basic feature of the Constitution. What this essentially means is that no government, no parliament can actually amend the constitution in a manner whereby the principle of secularism is in any way diluted or compromised. The Supreme Court has also held that a government which is not secular cannot be said to be a government that is being carried on in accordance with the provisions of the constitution. Keeping this in mind, this module seeks to explain the scope of religious liberties in India by introducing students to judicial de decisions on the three most important articles as far as the freedom of religion is concerned, namely Articles 25, 26 and 28 of the Constitution. Now quickly, let's go through the learning outcomes of this module. The purpose of this module is twofold. First, the module aims to give the students an overview of the constitutionally recognized components of an individual's right to freedom of religion and conscience as laid down by the Supreme Court of India. The second object is to help the students understand the manner in which the right to freedom of religion and conscience is protected by the constitution and to help the student understand the scope and limit of the said right. Article 25 of the constitution reads as follows. Freedom of conscience and free profession, practice and propagation of religion. Subject to public order, morality and health and to the other provisions of this part, all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right freely to profess, practice and propagate religion. Nothing in this article shall affect the operation of any existing law or prevent the state from making any law, regulating or restricting any economic, financial, political or other secular activity which may be associated with religious practice. Providing for social welfare and reform or the throwing open of Hindu religious institutions of a public character to all classes and sections of Hindus. Article 25 also has two explanations. Explanation 1. The wearing and carrying of kirpans shall be deemed to be included in the profession of the Sikh religion. Explanation 2. A reference to Hindus in Article 25 shall be construed as including a reference to persons professing the Sikh, Jain or Buddhist religion. And a reference to Hindu religious institutions shall be construed accordingly. Now let's break down Article 25. Article 25 can be said to be a comparatively weaker fundamental right. The reason for this is Article 25 is restricted by the other rights in Part 3 of the Constitution. That is the chapter on fundamental rights. See, the reason for this is it is important to protect the encroachment of basic fundamental rights of one group by another group in the name of its right to practice religious freedom. The court, in order to balance these conflicting considerations, has taken a broad view of religion. It has defined religion as a matter of faith with individuals or communities and it is not necessarily theistic. If the right to freedom of religion is given pride of place, is given importance over other rights, then there is a distinct possibility that members of a particular religious community who might be larger in number might oppress the rights of another community that's smaller in number. The court, in order to balance these conflicting considerations, has taken a broad view of religion. It has defined religion as a matter of faith with individuals or communities and it is not necessarily theistic. What that essentially means that you don't actually have to believe in a god. In support of this assertion, the court cited the examples of Buddhism and Jainism which, don't be, which do not believe in a god, with Gautam Buddha and Mahavir Jain respectively being the if you like human embodiments of that religion. 
the court has held that religion is the belief which binds spiritual nature of men to a supernatural being. So it's interesting here the conflict in the judgments of the court. On the one hand, the court says that religion binds the spiritual nature of man to a supernatural being. But at the same time, a belief in God is not necessary. So what about Gautam Buddha and Mahavir Jain? Were they gods or were they supernatural beings? So it perhaps both of them fell somewhere in between being a god and a supernatural being. Nonetheless, the court has held emphatically that a belief in a god is absolutely not essential for there to be a religious religion includes worship, belief, faith, devotion and extends to rituals. So going to the temple, going to the mosque, going to the church, going to the synagogue, that's worship. Belief, belief in the holy scriptures, faith, making a pilgrimage to Mecca, devotion, going to temples. Again, all of this is included in the ambit of the word religion and it extends to rituals. What rituals? Does it extend to? We will see shortly. Thereby, religious right of a person believing in a particular faith is his or her right to practice, preach and profess that particular faith. Now let's come to an unfortunate case, the case of Dara Singh. In this case, Rabindra Kumar alias Dala Dara Singh essentially slaughtered a Christian missionary and his family. In advocating the principle of toleration, the court in Dara Singh's case held that there is no justification for interfering in someone's belief by use of force, provocation, conversion and incitement or upon a flawed premise that one religion is better than the other. In Dara Singh's case, the court emphatically held that the use of force can never be justified just because another individual is exercising his or her right to propagate, practice or profess her, his or her religion. In order to identify what is protected in Article 25 and what is not, the court has come up with an inventive solution called an essential practice test. The test prescribes that only those practices that are essential to a religion are protected under Article 25 and other ancillary, subsidiary if you will, activities cannot be given the constitutional protection under Article 25. In the case of Commissioner of Police versus Jagdish Varananda Avadut, the Commissioner of Police Calcutta imposed a ban on the Tandava case, on the Tandava dance, sorry. A divine dance attributed to the Hindu god Shiva from being performed in public places and streets. Those of you who are from Calcutta will recognize the Tandava dance, which is performed in the streets by members of the Ananda Marg sect. The Commissioner's order was challenged by the followers of Ananda Marg as infringing their rights under Article 25 and 26. The court then traced the origins of the Ananda Marg and found that Tandava dance performed by carrying trident snakes, damru, lati and human skull in public was not an essential rite of the Ananda Mark faith. This is important. This is the essential practice test being applied by the Supreme Court. Now what went into the Tandava dance? They would carry latis, human skulls and perform the dance in public. So what the court essentially had to see in this case was, was the carrying of latis, human skulls and performing the dance in public an essential part of the Ananda Mark faith? Was it an essential right of the Ananda Mark faith? In another case, the state of Bombay versus Naraso Appa Mali, a Hindu man tried to challenge the constitutionality of an act criminalizing bigamy on the ground that it violated his religious freedom. The court held that bigamy again was not an essential feature of Hinduism. Maybe it was an aspect, but it was not an essential practice, an essential feature, an essential right, if you will of Hinduism. And accordingly, the man was not able to claim protection under the constitution to avoid serving his sentence for bigamy, which is an offence under the Indian Penal Code. Now coming to the Sikh faith, this right of freedom of religion has been used to deny admission to some male students who had shorn their hair, cut their hair and female students who had plucked their eyebrows in Sikh institutes, educational institutes. The court held that keeping unshown hair, not plucking your eyebrows, was an essential component of the Sikh religion. And those who did so could be denied admission to educational institutions in the state of Punjab. Now let's look at the interesting issue of temple offerings. Many of you who go to temples will see that maybe you, you yourself offer a lot of money and donations to your deity of choice. In a case, Sri Jagannath Temple Puri Management Committee versus Chintamani, the 
respondent Chintamani asked for a piece of the temple offerings. The Supreme Court held that the right of temple attendance, Chintamani being one of them, to be given a share of the offerings to the deity in the temple was not a part of the religion. This was purely a matter, a financial matter and nothing to do with religion. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what is an essential right and what is not? The court has sort of tried to solve this problem, rather unsuccessfully I would say, by giving a few illustrations. They have held the following customs as constituting an essential practice of the Hindu religion, for example. They have held that periodical ceremonies to be performed in a certain manner is a part of the Hindu religion. And they have interestingly held that the total prohibition of the slaughter of the progeny of cows, the offspring of cows, is also an essential practice. A total ban on the slaughter of the progeny of cows is an essential practice of the Hindu religion. Conversely, they have also held certain practices as not being part of certain religions. A right to perform prayers through loudspeakers. In the case of the Church of God versus KKRMC Welfare Association, where they held that performing prayers through a loudspeaker is not an essential right. Performing prayers might be, but using a loudspeaker to do so is certainly not an essential right of the professing or practicing of your religion. They've also held that bursting firecrackers without any restriction cannot be held to be a part of the Hindu faith. Now, coming to the contentious issue of conversion. As far as the right to propagate one's religion is concerned, the court has rather controversially held in the case of Stanislaus that there is no fundamental right to convert another person to one's own religion. This judgment appears to be suspect, but as things stand, it is the law of the land. The judgment essentially held that the states that there is no fundamental right to convert another person to one's own religion because if a person purposely undertakes the conversion of another person to his religion, that would impinge on the freedom of conscience guaranteed to all citizens of the country alike. Essentially, what the court said in Stanislas was any attempt to convert another individual would be interfering with their right to make a decision of their own volition, listening to their own conscience. Like I said, this decision is suspect but it has not really been challenged by the courts. But it is likely that if a similar challenge was to come up, the uh, Stanislas is likely to be struck down. So that, in a nutshell, are the cases on Article 25. Now let's move to the cases on Article 26, the freedom to manage religious affairs. The constitution in Article 26 has given the right to religious denominations to manage their own affairs subject to certain restrictions. Let's first look at the text of Article 26. Article 26 goes thus, freedom to manage religious affairs, subject to public order, morality and health, every religious denomination or any section thereof shall have the right, A, to establish and maintain institutions for religious and charitable purposes, to manage its own affairs in matters of religion, to own and acquire movable and immovable property, and to administer such property in accordance with law. Let us now break down each of these four clauses. It's pertinent to note here that this right is not available to persons, i.e. individuals in Article 25, but to religious denominations as a group. In order for a group to qualify as a religious denomination, the Supreme Court has laid out certain conditions. So what is a religious denomination? According to the Supreme Court, a religious denomination is a collection of individuals forming a religious sect, having a common faith and organization and designated by a distinctive name. Common faith of the community based on religion is also an aspect of religious denomination. A common religious tenet, particular to themselves, is also a part of a religious denomination. So how does one go about determining whether a particular cult or a sect is a religious denomination? The Supreme Court has simply said that there is no set test. It is, in their own words, a mixed question of law and fact. The question whether a community constitutes a religious denomination or not has to be determined by having recourse to the beliefs of that particular cult or sect and to the facts of the case. So a general rule cannot really be laid down. So let us take Scientology, which is one of the up and coming religions of the world. They have an interesting take. They have L. Ron Hubbard, who they call their guru, essentially, and they worship him. And a book that he has written is essentially treated as, as their gospel, their holy book. Is Scientology a religion? Well, that's an interesting question and the answer depends on the law and the fact. And the court 
if it is to determine whether Scientology is a religion and a religious denomination, they will have to essentially go into the aspects and tenets of Scientology before arriving at a conclusion. Now let's return to the Ananda Marga case, in which we discussed in the context of Article 25. In Ananda Marga, the petitioners there, obviously the sect Ananda Marga, claimed the right to perform Tandava on the street. They were considered to be a religious denomination of Hinduism, but not a separate religion. So it's interesting. I want all of you to clearly note the difference between a religious denomination and a separate religion. Ananda Marg is considered a religious denomination of Hinduism, much as say the Arya Samaj might be. But it is not a separate religion. Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, again, as far as the constitution is concerned, constitute a part of the Hindu faith. But their tenets might differ from Hinduism. So notice again the difference between Article 25 and Article 26. As far as Article 25 is concerned, an individual who is a Sardarji has the same rights that are guaranteed to his Hindu brethren. But let us assume that there is a religious denomination of Sikhs in Punjab. They as a collective, as a religious denomination, have their own rights and have the rights to manage their own affairs. And for the purposes of Article 26, they are considered a separate religion and a religious denomination as well, falling under that religion. Now, another interesting term that has been interpreted by the Supreme Court is the term matters of religion. What constitutes matters of religion and what doesn't constitute matters of religion? The term matters of religion, the Supreme Court has held, is of particular importance as the matters which are not essentially religious or are secular in nature will not be covered under this provision. Essentially, what Articles 26 and in fact what 25 also does is essentially take out matters, activities that are secular in nature from protection. Thus, excommunication on the ground of religion has been held to be a part of the right to manage religious affairs of a denomination. Our very own Mahatma Gandhi, for example, was outcast when he crossed the seven seas and went to England to become a barrister. Now, he was essentially excommunicated. Now, that would be a matter for his community and his caste. Similarly, if a particular religion was to excommunicate an individual on the ground that he has committed blasphemy, let us say, then that excommunication whereby he is cast out from the religion is purely a matter of religion. And therefore, the religious denomination of the religion which casts him out has complete control on the manner in which he is excommunicated. But that being said, the administration of that denomination's property is not. So let us look at Pentecostal Christians, for example, who are a part of the Protestant faith of Christianity. Pentecostals have some strange rituals like beating each other on the chest. Now, that is a matter of religion. Now, the church on the, the property of the, the church might be situated on property on land and the administration of that property is a purely secular matter. So the administration of that property must be carried out in accordance with secular laws and the Pentecostal church or any other denomination cannot claim that that property may be administered as they choose to. Because simply put, administration of property is a secular matter. Matters relating to the faith itself, that's a matter of religion. Continuing on with matters of religion, we come now to matters of administration. The UP legislature passed a law which transferred administrative control of a temple from a group of priests to a statutory board. The court held that the actions of the UP legislature did not constitute interference in matters of religion, but only in matters of administration and was constitutional. So let us, for example, in this same case, twist the facts a little. Let us say that the Uttar Pradesh legislature transfers control of how the deity is worshipped and how the deity is cleaned on a daily basis, the clothes that are put on the deity, the rituals associated with worshipping the deity in the temple. If that control is given to a statutory board and it's taken out of the hands of the religious denomination, that is a violation of their right to manage their own religious affairs. But to simply take matters of administration and to put it in the hands of a statutory board is not a violation of the right under Article 26 because it is not a matter of religion. So, for example, regulating the wages that the temple workers are paid is not a matter of religion, but it is a secular matter concerning the wages of laborers. 
So what are secular and non-secular matters? Let's to sum up, the Supreme Court simply said, although the state cannot interfere with freedom of a person to profess, practice and propagate his religion, the state can control the secular matters connected with religion. Again, simply put, a secular matter is a matter which is not religious in nature. The Supreme Court has clearly held that all the activities in or connected with a temple are not religious activities. The management of a temple or maintenance of discipline and order inside the temple can be controlled by the state. So like I just explained to you, right? if the state regulates the wages that laborers working in a temple must be paid, that is not a matter of religion. It is a matter of labor law. If any law is passed for taking over the management of a temple, it simply cannot be struck down on the ground as violative of 25 or 26. The management of the temple is a secular act. So to sum up, a secular act falls outside the protection guaranteed under Article 25 and 26. So it's only the matters of religion that are entirely outside the pale of law and not matters with respect to property which has to be held, administered and enjoyed according to law. So very clearly, only matters of religion, not anything else. So it's extremely important that you understand what is a matter of religion and what is not. And for that, the cases that we have been discussing and the cases we will now discuss will help you and will guide you. Now, simply put, the state has the power to regulate the administration of trust properties by means of laws validly enacted. But under Article 26 Clause D, it is the religious denomination or general body of religion itself which has the right to administer this property in accordance with any valid law. So what the Supreme Court is trying to tell you here is this. It says the parliament or the state legislature can enact a law, a law that essentially governs the administration, the management of temples. But under Article 26 Clause D, the religious denomination or the general body of the religion itself has still the duty to administer this property. But they cannot do so in accordance with the tenets of their religion. If their religion says that somebody who works in the temple or the mosque or the church should not be paid anything and a law states that no, they must be paid a minimum wage, then it is that law that governs. It is the law that governs and not the tenet of the religion. And it is up to that religious denomination or general body of the religion itself to administer that temple in accordance with such a law. So this dispute between matters of religion and a secular act has most often come up in the context of property matters. And clearly, when it concerns the property, it is a secular act. In Ghulam Abbas versus State of Uttar Pradesh, the Supreme Court held that the customary religious right of the Shia community, a sect of the Muslim community, on a piece of land to perform religious rites and practices is protected under Article 26. So now notice the fine distinction between a matter of religion and a secular act. The Shia community claimed the right to perform certain rights, R-I-T-E-S, rights, religious rights on a piece of land. The Supreme Court held that their right to perform those religious rights was guaranteed and was protected under Article 26. That was not a matter of property. That was a matter of religion. It so happened that it is a matter of religion that had an incidental nexus, if you will, an incidental encroachment on a secular act, which is the property itself. Therefore, in Ghulam Abbas, the Supreme Court held that the petitioners had the right to perform religious rites on that piece of land and that was protected under Article 26. A landmark case is that of the TMA Pi Foundation versus the state of Karnataka decided by the Supreme Court in the year 2003. The court said in TMA Pi that the state could not interfere with the established customary rights of Shia Muslims to perform their religious ceremonies and functions. This right has been expanded to include in it the right to establish and maintain educational institutions. This was at issue in TMA Pi. Right? Let me repeat. The right has been expanded to include in it the right to establish and maintain educational institutions to every religious denomination or any section thereof to establish and maintain for religious and charitable purposes subject to public order, morality and health. So essentially under Article 26, you have the right, if you are a Shia Muslim, if you are a Hindu, if you are a Christian, to start your own school. 
so the various convent schools that we have in this country or the various madrasas for example that we have in this country are all perfectly constitutional and those religious denominations have the right to start those schools and in those schools they have every right to impart religious instruction but that right of course is restricted by public order morality and health therefore if in a particular madrasa certain instruction is being imparted that goes against public order or in a church certain instruction is being imparted that goes against morality or in a certain religious school a jain school a buddhist school a sikh school you have, whatever what have you particular religious instruction is being imparted that go that is against the interests of health there that right gets curtailed just to reiterate this is the right of religious denominations to establish their own educational institutions and to administer those institutions not state institutions not government schools be very clear on that now something very important and should have been absolutely clear to you especially to those of you who have been students of law in the past the rights under article 26 are not absolute they are not absolute an act which allowed hari jans to enter hindu temples was challenged was challenged as a violation of article 26 rights of a religious denomination to manage its own religious affairs in the case of venkatramanna versus the state of mysore the act was held to be constitutional as any law under article 26 is subject to uh, and controlled by a law protected under article 25 clause 2b which is essentially the throwing open of hindu temples in the interests of social welfare and social reform therefore the rights under article 25 and 26 are not absolute and are always subject to public order morality health or social welfare and social reform and therefore as i said earlier one can safely conclude that the rights under article 25 and 26 are comparatively weaker fundamental rights now coming to article 28 this deals with freedom as to attendance at religious instruction or religious worship in certain educational institutions article 28 clause 1 says no religious instruction pay careful pay, pay careful attention to the text of this clause no religious no, no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution wholly maintained out of state funds what clause 1 is saying is no religious instruction so first thing you have to that has to flag in your mind is okay what is the meaning of religious instruction you've got to ask yourself that right what is the meaning of religious instruction second you have to pay attention to that part of the clause which says wholly maintained out of state funds so you immediately are thinking wait wholly maintained so that means if it's partly maintained is instruction permissible the answer would be yes right well nothing in clause 1 shall apply to an educational institution which is administered by the state but has been established under any endowment or trust which requires that religious instruction shall be imparted in such institution let me give you an example that will help you understand this clause what the constitution here is trying to say is as a general rule no religious instruction shall be imparted at an institution wholly maintained out of state funds let us say a government school is set up in okla that government school in okla cannot impart religious instruction under any circumstances why not because it is wholly maintained out of state funds now let us assume a school is set up in okla under a religious endowment by the arya samaj and the arya samaj requires that the vedas and the upanishads be taught it probably goes against the tenets of the arya samaj but for the sake of the example let's go with it so in this school set up by the arya samaj or ananda mark or any religious denomination or the church of seven day adventists or the pentecostals there is a requirement that religious instruction be imparted in such an institution even if that educational institution is administered by the state religious instruction is still permissible provided it has been established under an endowment or trust which requires that such instruction be imparted now you might ask yourself does this simply mean that members of a particular faith 
with perhaps a lot of wealth could essentially impose a condition that religious instruction be imparted and then only will they give the state funds to set up a school? The answer is yes. Here the constitution has sought to seek a compromise. They've sought to make a compromise here, which is okay. We have low literacy levels and we need schools for our children. But at the same time, we don't want to impart religious instruction and we can't if it's wholly maintained out of state fund. What if the state runs out of money to set up schools, which has essentially happened? What if a religious benefactor, a rich, wealthy businessman perhaps, who has established a trust or an endowment, central to which is the Buddhist faith, and here he is willing to give you crores of rupees to set up an excellent school for the benefit of the children of this country, and you, the state, will have to refuse him because he wants you to impart religious instruction in that school. Well, Article 28, one of the exceptions, allows the state to take that money and impart religious instruction in the interests of education. Another important clause, no person attending any educational institution recognized by the state or receiving aid out of state funds shall be required to take part in any religious instruction that may be imparted in such institution or to attend any religious worship that may be conducted in such institution or in any premises attached thereto unless such person or if such person is a minor, his guardian has given consent thereto. What that essentially means is that if you are attending a government school, you cannot be compelled to take part in any religious instruction. So again, if this wealthy benefactor who belongs to the Buddhist faith insists that religious instruction be imparted at a school set up under an endowment, then the children of that school have every right to refuse religious instruction. If they are a minor, obviously which they will be, having being school children, their guardian can also refuse to give consent. However, if the guardian says, no, it is okay, I would like my child to attend classes on the tenets of Buddhism, I'd like my child to attend the religious instruction classes where he is taught the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita and he is made to pray, then it is fine. Otherwise, the state cannot compel any person attending such an educational institution recognized by the state or receiving aid out of state funds. Of course, needless to say, it does not apply to private school. The Supreme Court has held that Article 28 only imposes a ban on imparting religious instruction and not a ban on study of religions. And now things get slightly more complex. The Supreme Court has drawn a distinction between religious instruction and the study of religions. Many of you might have known that people have degrees in religions. You can get a degree in a particular religion, theology. There is an entire discipline dedicated to the study of religions. So, any institution maintained wholly out of state funds imparting classes in theology, would that be unconstitutional? The Supreme Court has held no. In Aruna Roy versus Union of India, the petitioner Aruna Roy challenged the National Curriculum Framework for School Education, published by National Council of Educational Research and Training, NCERT, uh, being, uh, as being against the constitutional mandate and anti-secular on the grounds that it consisted of teaching of various religions. Essentially, the CBSE board permitted the teaching of religions. Now the question was, is that unconstitutional? Because it is an institution that is maintained wholly out of state funds. These schools, if it's maintained wholly out of state funds and you are imparting religious instruction, or are you? That was that issue, basically. The court held that there is no prohibition on study of religions. It is okay to study Hinduism. It is okay to study Christianity. It is okay to study about Jesus Christ. It is okay to study about the Prophet Muhammad. There is no such prohibition. Why? The Supreme Court said this is for having a value-based social life in a society which is degenerating for power, post or property. Whether you agree with that statement or not, some of you might disagree. The Supreme Court has simply said that religion and moral values go hand in hand. The court further held that the process of making the students acquainted with the basics of all religions should begin in middle school and continue up to the university level. In the court's opinion, this would help students realize the basic concept behind every religion is common, only the practices differ. And even if certain differences exist in terms of opinion, people should learn to coexist peacefully and cordially. 
there is an age old saying people generally fear what they cannot understand and it that appears to be playing on the minds of the supreme court wherein they say study religions study all religions study all religions make up your mind if need be about each of those religions but please do not impart religious instruction please do not tell them that jesus christ is their lord and savior by all means tell them that jesus christ was born in bethlehem but don't tell them that jesus christ is the lord and savior that is exactly what the supreme court is trying to get at finally let's come to the dav college case uh in this case the punjab legislature passed the guru nanak university act under which university was established by notification under the act the punjab uh, government made dav college in punjab affiliated dav college in jalandhar affiliated to the said university guru nanak university section 4 of that act said that the university shall i shall i quote make provision for study and research on the life and teachings of guru nanak and their cultural and religious impact in the context of indian and world civilization unquote dav cha- college challenged the act contending that the act was violative of article 28 as the main object of the act was to propagate sikh religion the sikh religion in educational institutions dav college said no how can we teach uh, the students about guru nanak the court rejecting the petitioner's contention held that to provide for academic study of life and teaching or the philosophy or culture of any great saint of india in relation to or the impact on the indian and world civilizations cannot be considered as making provision for religious instruction once again it was merely the study of religion so that brings us to the end of this module what have we learned let's recap we've seen how the right to freedom of conscience and religion has been stated in an abstract manner in the constitution we've seen how the supreme court has taken great pains to interpret each and every word and phrase in articles 25 26 28 we've seen how they've sought to draw a distinction between concepts such as matters of religion and matters that are secular in nature we have seen how they have devised something known as the essential practice test to see whether certain practices are central to a particular faith so as to warrant constitutional protection or are merely ancillary to that faith thereby not warranting the strict constitutional protection guaranteed under articles 25 26 and 28 we've also learned about educational institutions and what kind of educational institutions you can impart religious instruction in one can safely say that the supreme court has done a laudable job in a country like india which is full of religious diversity and even within these religions there is no consensus on what constitutes the essential characteristics of that religion the supreme court has managed to strike the right balance between an individual's freedom of religion and the need for social control as long as they continue to do so india will continue to be a society that is governed by the rule of law